So what I'd like to do, having said a little bit about how we should talk in different voices, I thought I should practice what I preach. I'm going to read a um, first segment, uh, one short segment of the book I'm writing. Um, Phoebe said that it's called Love and Contracts. Um, the idea is to have a book that has two different voices. There are five memoir chapters and there are five family law chapters. As I go through the process of having a baby with a gay man and then meeting the woman I'm going to marry when the baby is in diapers, that's the memoir. As I go through each stage of building this family, I have family law chapters that tag how other people are going through similar things. I call these people Plan B families. The big idea behind the book, love comes in different packages, and law can, should, and often does recognize that love comes in these different packages by recognizing Plan B families. So. I'm going to read the part of the memoir that um, takes place in um, 2002. I'm in Salt Lake City in a doctor's office. The characters are me, single, white, 39, desperate to have a child. I've just left a partnership of 12 years because I wanted a baby and she didn't. We, um, I left the, I, I got out of ta Dodge. I left the state. I got a new job. I, I'm in Salt Lake. Everything's quite new. Um, Victor is the other character. He's my baby daddy. I've known him through <laughs> since law school. I call him up when I'm trying to figure out how to have a baby. We haven't talked in a little while. I say, remember how we talked about having a baby in law school? That was 15 years ago. He says, yeah. I said, well, do you want to? He said, what do you have in mind? <laughs> we talk about it. Go to Provincetown. Eventually, he tells me one day, the same day I get into the ALI, he tells me he's inclined to inseminate. <laughs> so we do inseminate with the help of a cast of thousands, including lots of doctors, lots of states, lots of very good stories. The first doctor to do an insemination is Victor's friend, Alice. Alice is his friend from junior high. One of the reasons I choose Victor is that his best friends are his friends from his junior high childhood in rural Tennessee. I figure if he has never in 15 years told me a story about someone doing him wrong, chances are I won't do him wrong and that we will get along and be able to cobble together this family I learned to call weirdo family. So Alice grows up and she's an OBGYN. She's in Tennessee and does the first insemination, which does not take. At the time I'm reading, I'm in Salt Lake. I've been living there for about a month. And um, we're in the doctor's office, as I said. Before I read this, as I generally do when I read segments of the memoir, I call forth another inspirational voice and spirit, which is Walt Whitman. The little boy in this book is named Walter. And he's named for Walt Whitman. So I start off by invoking two lines from Songs for the Open Road. I give you myself before preacher or law. Will you give me yourself? Will you travel with me? Please don't tell anyone, Dr. Short tells us on the first office visit. She explains she's the only OBGYN in Salt Lake City who inseminates single or gay women, and other doctors have given her a lot of flack for that. We nod in agreement, quickly exchanging glances of irritation about living in the shadow of the Mormon church. Victor's new home state, Texas, is nearly as red. He's taken a day off from his new law teaching job to fly up from Houston so we can inseminate with fresh sperm. The waiting room is filled with white, wholesome heterosexuals. Some, I whispered to Victor, must be here for alternative insemination, too. When the nurse called Victor's name, he shot up as if propelled out of his chair. Five minutes later, I welcome him back with, hey, big guy, and a high five. It's, <laughs> it still feels like we're getting away with something, like our first insemination in Alice's office. So different from what straight couples must feel when they get fertility treatments. Embarrassment, maybe. or fear that needing a doctor to do the deed that most people do at home reveals a failure of masculinity or femininity. But for gay people, being here is a triumph over the common way of doing things. Only in my adult life, since the 1990s, have lots of us been able to have kids, thanks to reproductive technologies like alternative insemination. Before then, most doctors would only help straight married couples. Today, Utah is among the few places 
where doctors still put up no gays or single signs to voice their judgment of Plan B families. Dr. Short quickly switches course from reminding us how Big Brother feels about us, sweeping one of her slim arms and hurting us over to a microscope, saying, come see this. I look first, and then Victor, and we each respond with the same gee whiz tone. Wow. Millions of tiny white tadpoles zip around excitingly on the glass. My own excitement shows up when the nurse noted my unusually high blood pressure. No wonder my heart's expanding with the hope that I'll soon be buying little footy pajamas. Men always love to see that, Dr. Short laughs and continues, we're in great shape. There should be no difficulty getting you pregnant. But difficulties quickly arise. We wait in the examination room fully 25 minutes, staring at the sperm-filled syringe sitting in the instrument tray. I picture those determined-looking sperm gasping for breath and expiring one by one and wonder aloud whether the presumably Mormon office staff is sabotaging our efforts. It'll be fine, Martha Victor reassures me. High school girls get pregnant through their pants. <laughs> Plus, he says, doctors are usually pressured for time, shuttling between patients. Finally, Dr. Short arrives, and Victor leaves, wishing me luck. The doctor does her job with less ceremony than Alice did. As before, it's painless. Victor comes back to chat while I lie with my heels up against the office wall. We imagine the little tadpoles splashing up against the uterine wall, and Victor imitates Homer Simpson's do, as if it's him ricocheting around in there. Can the nurses hear us laugh do they know we're gay? Do any straight couples laugh during inseminations? Two weeks later, I get my period. It's Rosh Hashanah again. A year from when I asked Victor to be my baby daddy, I still can't sign my name in the section, res uh, the, in the section reserved for mothers in the Book of Life. Four months later, still no joyful little bundle of cells. The giddiness is gone, and we can't even blame the Mormons. When you're, <laughs> when you're over 35, doctors refer to your pregnancy as geriatric and label you <laughs> infertile if you've tried unsuccessfully for six months. I'm on month seven, and at 39, every month counts more. The fertility drug, drug Dr. Short puts me on to produce extra eggs hasn't worked, and she tells me that an infertility specialist, Dr. Hanaka, can provide provide more high-tech help. Like her, he's the only one in Salt Lake City who will see single and gay people. How much does it cost, I ask him, knowing it's a fake question. I'll pay just about anything to get or even try to get pregnant, everything short of the $10,000 per cycle required for in vitro fertilization. $178 for a daily ultrasound, starting on day 12 of your cycle. $60 or so for the Clomid each month, since I'm doubling the dosage. $300 for the hamster test. Then the usual $175 for the insemination itself. If we switch to Pergonol from Clomid, it'll be $2,000 to $3,000 a month, plus daily ultrasounds. Only the hamster test is new to me. I know from the web search that Pergonol is a demanding and extremely expensive, requiring daily injections, periodic blood tests, and ultrasounds to protect against producing monster-sized eggs. Victor, looking at the same website on his computer a thousand miles away, said the drug must cost so much because they have to chase down postmenopausal women and buy their urine to make it. According to Dr. Hanaka, the hamster test zooms in on whether the man is the one who's infertile. They, te they test whether a sperm can penetrate an egg by mixing it up with hamster eggs. And since human and hamster eggs are similar, a sperm that penetrates a hamster egg can do the same for a human one. I absorb the numbers, trying not to make a wisecrack about sex with small furry animals. <laughs> I want this man to like me, to help me, so I don't even mention the price tags for fear of seeing undercommitted. Little or none of the fees are covered by my insurance, though it might be if I were straight or living somewhere other than Utah. I take a deep breath and look into his eyes, which are kind but a little distant behind wire-rimmed aviator glasses spanning his squarish face. What are my chances of getting pregnant, I ask. It seems much more likely that my body is at fault. Guys can father a child into their 80s, but women are out of the game at halftime. Well, he begins taking out a Xerox copy of a chart, pointing at a spot on a curve, 39 years old, with hormone levels still consistent with fertility, but waning, otherwise healthy, without a history of miscarriages or stillbirths. I glance around the room at the words miscarriage and stillbirth, looking for wood to knock on. But everything is plastic, chrome or vinyl, so I knock my head with a thin smile. He smiles back. He sees so many of us, so fragile, so determined. He continues, if Victor's sperm has sufficient motility and ability to penetrate, you have about a 10 to 20% chance each cycle, then an about a 50% chance overall. 
10 to 20 percent, I echo, and Dr. Hanaka nods. The downward sloping line leads no doubt how fast my chances are evaporating. That night, when I recap for Victor, I save the hamster test for last. Dr. Hanaka says we can do a test to see if the problem is that your sperm can't penetrate my eggs. It's called the hamster test, I say. <laughs> what? He erupts. But my sperm count was normal, actually better than average for a 40-year-old. Each shot has a good 60 million sperm, and the lab said, in Nashville said that 25% were swimmers. They ha that's above the 8 million needed for pregnancy. I guess it's obvious we're trying to figure out who's at fault, and I wish I could make it all better. Have I heard him? Is he mad? Will this test be one thing too many? I'm so sorry, Victor. Apparently, even with the normal sperm count, some men's sperm can't actually get into the egg. They don't have the right proteins or something. It may just be bad luck, but if something's wrong, I should know about it now. I'm already 39. I wait for his response, but he's silent. What must it feel like for a man who's aced exams all his life to get tested by a hamster? <laughs> Might it be especially painful for a gay man to find out he's shooting blanks, as if it marked him as less of a man? Finally, he says wearily, hamster test? Do I have to run around inside a wheel while I masturbate or something? Jesus, I hate these doctors. I know, it's awful, I sigh. What if it works, Victor asks, taking a laugh it off tone I like much more. Will we get a nerdy little hamster studying drama, listening to Cher and wanting to summer in Provincetown? Then with irritation, this is just wrong. I laugh, saying the furry little guy who's lucky enough to call Victor dad won't get burned on the beach, but I'll have trouble renting a bike to get out to Herring Cove. I also tell him they can do it with the frozen sperm samples he sent from Houston back in the fall, so he doesn't have to be here for the test. What are we going to do if there's a problem with my sperm and the hamster egg, he asked, and then adds before I can answer, I can't believe that sentence just came out of my mouth. We'll figure it out, I tell him. Don't worry. I'm sure it's going to be fine. So with that, I'm sure the next four panels are all going to be way more than fine. And we're on to the first one.